Welcome everybody. We are delighted that you've joined today's webinar and we are looking forward to sharing more information with you about creating an inclusive culture that honors all generations. Um, our goal today is really exploring the culture dimension. So we've um, been in the midst of a three-part webinar series where we talked more about what generations um, involve. We talked about generational gifts. And now we're talking about the context or culture that um, people work in and what it looks like when those cultures really honor the gifts of all generations. So it's my pleasure today to introduce to you, well actually Catherine's been my guest for the last uh, two webinars, Dr. Catherine Jeffrey, welcome and um, tell us about your passion for this topic. Yeah, thanks Donna, it's good to be here. Uh, I love this topic for many reasons. As I talked about last time, you know, I did my dissertation around the millennial generation and that's what got me really excited about the generations and understanding what's going on in this unique time in the workforce today where in some places you have five generations trying to work together. And I love that it's also, it's just relevant, right? Everyone has a story or experience of when they were trying to interact with another generation or maybe even in their own household, they have several generations and just getting through a meal might be an interesting experience for people. Even for me, when I was out in California not that long ago, I was walking along the beach and just by myself, didn't even have my phone on me and a young couple, they're probably like 23 to 25, uh, they asked me to take their photograph so he hands me, the guy hands me um, his iPhone, which was exactly the same iPhone that I have. And he proceeded to tell me and show me which button I needed to press to take a photo with, my, with his iPhone. And I found it quite humorous because even just walking down the beach, um, there can be some disconnect between the generations. And I just simply you know, thanked him for, for teaching me how to use the <laughs> iPhone and that I was, I was grateful for his wisdom. <laughs> so he was a, appreciating his elders is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And quite honestly, I didn't think I looked that old, but maybe I'm, you know, not aware. <laughs> Yeah, that's excellent context. And for me, um, you know, I've been learning a tremendous amount from Catherine, and she's done incredible work with companies like Duracell, coaching their leaders, educating them on some of the generational differences. But as we've had conversations, what I come to came to understand was that learning alone about the generational differences is really insufficient. So if leaders are not making the changes necessary to create an inclusive culture where all generations are honored, then they're going to continue having challenges um, attracting and retaining talent, which is one of the top issues CEOs have talked about today. Um, you know, there is a term that there's this war on talent where, you know, there's companies competing for some of the best people out there and culture is one of the key differentiators. And I think Catherine, that's even come up in your research as well, that it really matters when people are looking for new jobs. Uh, the organizational culture is a factor in their decision process. Yes. Huge. And it's only becoming more and more relevant and necessary. Yeah. yeah. So one of the key things I wanted to mention to every fine, fabulous individual that's listening to us today on the webinar, um, you are brilliant because you already have insight around generations. You're part of a generation and you have experiences working with people from generations other than your own. So as uh, questions come to mind or if you have insights, we would love to hear from you. Feel free to type those in the chat box and share that with everyone. Um, but Catherine and I are um, simply participating with you on this generational journey of learning and helping improve our skills and address our biases just as you are. So a quick um, overview of what we're gonna talk about in our conversation today. Our last two webinars went over generations and gifts and we wanted to make sure you had that context kind of connect the dots from them to this webinar. Then we're gonna explore what culture is. Because a lot of people um, define culture many different ways, just like the word communication or strategy means different things to, to different people. So we're gonna make sure 
that in our conversation today, we're level set and we all have a common definition and understanding of what culture is. And then finally, we're going to get into the heart of our conversation, which we're going to reveal to you today the three attributes or elements that make a generationally friendly culture. So that's our overview today. And we're going to get into what is all this talk about generations. So Catherine, take it away. So when we think about generations and what is a generation, you know, they've often been defined by birth years, 20 year span of birth years. Because of the speed of technology, they're saying that time span is being shortened. So now, and you can see the difference. We talked earlier in another webinar about millennials versus zennials and that, that flip from the next generation being every eight years. And then the other piece is shared experiences. What are the things we go through in those early formative years that help shape the way we view the world and the way we interact with the world? And then, and then what do we take with us into the workplace? What are we expecting? And as you look at the generations and you think about the characteristics of each one, do you feel like you fit in your generation? Or is there another one that you might fit you know, that you feel like you resonate with more. And that, that can be the case for a lot of people. So feel free to self-select your generation. Um, and depending even on where your siblings fall, maybe you have older siblings and they've pulled you into the generation above you. And that's okay as we talk about this. And Donna, even for you, when you look at the generations and your age, do you feel like you fit into your specific generation? Yes and no. I think um, that's a great question. There's some aspects that I do and I really resonate with and others um, I don't. And I think another factor here is life stage. For me and my generation, I remember there was some pretty disparaging things said about us as we were entering the workforce, kind of similar to the millennials today. And I didn't I didn't relate to that at all, but I think as we've moved through our life stages, maybe we have a little more respect and those things aren't being said quite so often. I think you're right. <laughs> then when we think about our last webinar was on generational gifts and we decided we would focus on the good that each generation brought to the workplace for exactly the reason Donna just mentioned, right? Often when generations enter, they can be misunderstood or they're in a different life stage, so they see things differently. Then if you add in the, the technologies that have come up, right? Generations are thinking very differently and the, the gap seems to be growing more wide. And so we really wanted to focus on the good rather then the negative stereotypes, right? We've all heard, oh, well, you're a boomer. That means you're really impatient or you're immovable and you don't like new ideas or you're a millennial, so you're entitled, right? We hear enough of that. So how do we focus on the strengths that we each bring? And so if you want to check that out, that's available on webinar recording too. And then wanted to just remind everyone, you know, age, we talked about this, age is the number one diversity issue in the workplace in North America today. So there's lots of bias and judgment flying around out there. And so that's what leads us to this topic of creating a generational friendly culture. And before we launch into what the different generations are looking for, Donna's first going to talk to us about what culture is. So when you look at playing the game of work, one of the challenges that we have is that as an organization, people want to know in the workplace, what game are we playing and how do we win? And the culture is how we work together. So that's what we want to talk about is getting more clear and specific about how we define culture. And then Catherine's going to walk us through some specifics generation to generation in each of the cultural attributes we discovered through our research process. First of all, what exactly is culture? Well, there's lots of different definitions here, and you can see this is what the Webster's Dictionary says. Um, sometimes people talk about culture. It's the software of the mind, the way that we think. Um, and it's complicated because culture's got lots of different levels. There's the stuff that we see and observe. And Catherine, I think you were sharing with me, um, there's an incredibly high percentage of millennials that engage in body art. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yes. 
than the 70 percentile. Yeah, which is absolutely amazing. And other generations have a different view on tattooing the body. But for them, that's kind of a visual marker. And so you can see that and make a judgment. But there's there's something behind that, right? It's not like I'm a millennial and therefore I get a tattoo. Um, there's more to it. And isn't it true that there's sort of this belief, like there's some self-expression that goes on in how I show up and present myself, which is why um, the interesting body markings are potentially interesting ways of dressing. Yep. All that to say that culture is not just the things that you see. There's underlying beliefs and assumptions. And those very assumptions or beliefs, the expectations we bring into the workplace are shaped by the generational forces of when we grow up. And that's really why this culture clash exists within the workplace. As we're making the connection here, the way that you grew up impacts some of the beliefs that you bring into the workplace. Like Catherine, I remember um, you sharing, there's a generation that was taught you're to be seen and not heard. Exactly. The, that's what the boomers learned from their parents. So how does that manifest in the workplace then? So if I'm a boomer and I am leading the organization, that is what I expect, how my, I expect my younger and newer employees to interact with me. I am in charge, therefore I get to make the decisions and there's not a lot of two-way interaction or feedback. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a simple illustration of where the way that you're raised shaped causes you to have a certain belief and who said that's right or wrong, right? It's not like, oh, research shows that only old smart people are supposed to have a conversation. <laughs> not the boomers are old. Um, but the reality is that those forces shape you. And consequently, culture is nothing more than how we're expected to do things. And that can create some pretty significant challenges. In fact, in my experience, I've observed many leaders who transition, you know, and so they may be experienced um, employees who transition from one company to another, and they actually bring their expectations to the new workplace. So they keep behaving as if they were in the same place. And it's very similar when newer generations are coming into the workplace, they're bringing their expectations from their previous experience into the workplace and that's where the clashes can occur and that's what we're going to have fun exploring today how do we create a culture that really honors all those differences so what exactly is a generationally inclusive culture um, before I give you a definition, I just wanted to share with everybody a little bit of the process that we used in coming up with the attributes we're going to share with you so we uh, took Catherine's research, which was extensive in terms of all of the different aspects of generations, especially focused from a millennial viewpoint and uh, leveraged other generational experts research. And we took that and compared it against um, culture research, 40 years of how to create a constructive culture that leads to high levels of productivity and performance. And we sort of um, kind of integrated those views points. And from that, um, we came up with three key cultural attributes that define a generationally inclusive culture. And we're going to talk about each of those today, fearless, friendly, and focused. So the three F's. But the interesting thing, as we were um, kind of synthesizing all the research and really exploring what this meant, uh, what we realized is while all of these need to be present, not everyone has the same needs in each of the cultural attributes. So we're going to explore those attributes one by one, starting with fearless. And you'll notice that this is actually the largest of all of the cogs in the culture engine because it is so essential. In fact, when this dimension of culture is broken, other attributes, the friendly and focused attributes are relevant, but they're much less effective. So some of the key things um, are behaviors that are present when we live in a culture that is fearless, a generationally inclusive culture that's fearless, we behave in ways where we resist conformity. We're spontaneous. We're open about ourselves. 
we communicate our ideas because it's safe, right? We, we're not afraid of sharing things. We enjoy our work. We think in unique and independent ways. We're concerned about personal growth. We collaborate successfully and we're able to be creative. So you can see here um, the statement that we're connecting to fearless is that when, no matter what your generation is, when you're in a generationally inclusive culture, this is your experience. You're willing to speak up ask a question, make a mistake, present an idea, or take a risk because you believe that you will not be punished or humiliated. And now let's take a look at that from the generation's perspective. Catherine, what does it look like for boomers? So with the boomers, first you'll notice our little TV icon over there. That was a huge piece of technology for boomers. In the early 1950s, there were 4 million televisions. By 1960, there were 50 million. So this is a way a lot of information was distributed. And I think that's important as we think about technology and its impact on where communication is taking us in the workplace. And when we're, when we're focusing on safety and being in a fearless environment, boomers are asking the question, am I still relevant? Can I do the things I'm used to doing and still be considered relevant, still have a place in the organization? And am I able to ask questions about the new way that things are being done without feeling, I mean, I've had some boomers say, I feel stupid, right? Um, because they don't, it's, it's a different way of thinking and they don't want to feel that shame or even sometimes they talk about they feel humiliated because they do bring all this wisdom and experience, but it's now translated in different ways and used in different ways. And they're not always quite sure how to make that bridge to, to where the, the newest generations are and the way they're thinking about things. So for the rest of us, when we're working with boomers, it's important that we listen to their wisdom and understand that it matters, that boomers bring a wealth of knowledge and experience and that we don't want to discount that in any way. When, when a boomer's considering, am I still relevant? You know, there was this recent Twitter post that went viral that a Gen Zer posted and she was talking about how she had no idea how to burn a CD. And so millennials were commenting on this going, oh my gosh, I'm so old. How can they not know how to do this? And so imagine if already millennials at their stage of life are feeling quote unquote old, then imagine all the technology that has taken place between boomers and Gen Z and how that's impacting them. If you're a boomer, what does being relevant mean to you today versus when you started your career? And does it still mean the same thing or have you allowed it to adapt and change as the way we work and interact in the workplace has changed? Catherine, there was um, a great conversation I had yesterday. Uh, I was with a leadership team where the, the CEO was a boomer and he had some really young members of the leadership team and we were talking about expectations. So what his expectations were of the team and what their expectations were of him. And it was interesting because at one point in the conversation, uh, they raised the need for feedback. And so, you know, I captured that and then we further explored it because I said, well, what do you mean by feedback? And I, I was kind of made a joke because you, I've learned so much from you. But the fact of the matter is that feedback was generally an annual performance review, if that, right, from, from a yes. boomer standpoint. And so the CEO, that's what he knew. And they were and his team was really frustrated because they're like, we want more feedback. And so we really had to explore that because his perspective on that was so different than theirs. And so, um, you know, I, I tried to honor him because I wanted to recognize he, he was doing the best he knew how to do, but he didn't understand what their demands or expectations were. Absolutely. That's a great point. And that happens all the time, the need for feedback, even with Gen Z, you know, it's becoming more of a daily thing, a daily interaction. Mm -hmm. And so if, if, yeah, if we're not making that shift, we're really not going to be building that bridge of communication. And I think it's important 
to your comment, Donna, to, to flip that too, and for millennials and Gen Z to understand that for a boomer, face-to-face -face communication really matters. And sometimes understanding that, you know, their preference is to have a phone call instead of an email or a text message. And certainly if you throw an emoji in there for a lot of boomers, that doesn't feel professional. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of Gen Zers, right? That's, that's the way they communicate. That's part of their language. That's an excellent point. Because I remember even when texting first became prevalent and it seemed like such a personal method of communication. And now there's some leaders that I work with, like that's the only way that I can get their attention. Right. right? At first <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh no, you only text with your friends. And yeah. now it's, it's become a professional method of communication too. So yeah, it's, it's really evolved and just understanding what that looks like. Yeah. Now the big, one of the big conversations going on, right, is do we allow emojis into the workplace? Emojis can mean different things in different contexts, right? Uh -huh. How old is your workforce? You know, that, that's kind of the next evolution. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so if we move on to Gen X, when we're talking about a fearless environment, Gen Xers are asking, am, am I empowered to do what I need to do? Remember, these are your latchkey kids. They grew up very independently. They let themselves in when they got home from school. A lot of them did their homework alone. They might have started dinner. Highly adaptable, flexible, and responsible. So they want to know that they have options and alternatives and not just being told what to do. The tip, if you're working with a Gen Xer, is to give them what they need for the team to be successful. And don't, don't micromanage them. Gen Xers typically do not appreciate that. They're very self-led and they, they typically will figure out a way to make things happen. And so when you micromanage them, they feel pretty snuffed out. And if you're a Gen Xer, make sure that you're being clear with what you need and that you're asking the right people. Understand the culture you're in and make sure you're asking in the right way. Asking, ask people in a way that resonates with them. And that might be asking questions like, help me understand what you mean by this. Or how do you see this project moving forward? And then being able to offer your own thoughts and opinions. For millennials, when it comes to fearless, they would like to know, is it okay for me to speak my mind? Is it safe for me to speak up? Having a voice in the workplace is a huge priority to millennials. And Donna, just like you brought up, boomers were told you know, that kids were to be seen and not heard. Millennials were invited around the dinner table to share their opinions. And they asked, they, they heard from their parents and their parents told them how they were feeling. It was a very two-way conversation. So their voice really matters to them and they want to have space for that. A tip for those of us working with millennials is to make sure we're taking time to engage with them Make sure we're explaining to them the culture that they're in because they, again, we, and we talked about this in an earlier webinar, Gen Xers joined the culture that was there and millennials have started to m change the culture and things are shifting, but they also don't quite understand the culture they've entered into. And what's happening as I visit different businesses and different organizations is you've kind of got two sides of the fence. You've got millennials who are like, this is ridiculous. I don't understand why they're silos, why we're not all collaborating. And they, they're really uh, forcing change in their direction. And then I meet millennials who feel like they've somewhat lost themselves in the midst of the organization and they've changed the way they dress they change, they're very careful about the topics they talk about at work because they don't want to sound like a quote unquote millennial because then they're afraid they won't get to advance in the ways that they want to. And neither of those are good. So we've got to find a way to make it safe for them to really be who they are. Millennials, for you, think about when you want to speak your mind. Is it the right time for that? 
And that sometimes the people around you might not have time to hear it, or they might not have time to give you feedback. And just like Donna, you mentioned, right, the whole feedback process has changed a ton over time and has evolved from the annual review to quarterly to weekly to now almost daily. And so people have to adjust to that and, and make sure that you and your supervisor or whoever it is you're working with, that you have shared expectations around that so that you're not getting frustrated, but understand that there are different definitions of feedback and have a conversation with your boss about how and when it might be good to share your thoughts and make sure that you're not just wanting to share your own point of view, but that you're also willing to listen to what other people have to say. For Gen Z, they are asking, can I trust you when I look you in the eye? They want human interaction at work. This is what research is showing. And while 85% of them go online every day to learn something new, over 75% of them expect to learn on the job from their coworkers or other people rather than online. So this generation really does want to unplug, look you in the eye, and know that they can have an authentic relationship with you. So the tip is be the real you. Now, that doesn't mean that they want to hear about the stomach pains you have that day or how, you know, your cat got sick that morning. They might not want to hear all that information, um, but they do want to know that they can be helpful for you or that there are things that you might not understand um, how to do, say, on Instagram, but that they can help you with or that you need to gather more information around that. There, they enjoy and respect understanding some of the gaps that you might see in the way forward. And if you're a Gen Zer, make sure that you're not jumping to conclusions about why someone does something. It's likely that there's more than meets the eye to the situation and the people involved. I can remember when I was teaching college students, there'd be certain things obviously that you don't share with students that are going on at a university level. And then when it would be unrolled out to the, the school at large, some of the students would be upset saying, well, why, why didn't you tell me? I don't understand. And I would have to explain to them, well, you're a student. And so the time for you to find out was now, not a month ago, right? But they, they want to be involved in the process and that's good. But Gen Zers understand that there is a process and that when those who are in it with you feel like it's time for you to know, they, they will certainly let you know. And now Donna's going to introduce the next cultural component. Thanks, Catherine. In a generationally inclusive culture, we just talked about fearless and the fact that that looks different from generation to generation. The next component, or the next cultural attribute of a generationally inclusive culture is being friendly. So you can see here, when I am in an organization where the culture is friendly, here's how people experience that. They feel that they belong there because they recognize or they believe that they're valued, they're cared for, and they're accepted. So some of the behaviors that exist in an organization that's friendly include encouragement. So sometimes we talk about empowerment, and I think encouragement's part of that, but very specifically that we encourage others. Uh, we also resolve conflict constructively. And uh, Catherine, I think there's some research on this, right? But, in, but conflict is something that exists in the workplace, especially when there's a lot of differences. And unfortunately, a lot of people haven't received, or they don't necessarily have a skill in it. So they haven't received training or education. They don't go to school and learn how to deal with conflict. Correct. And so consequently, there's this weird thing that can happen in the workplace where you can have leaders who are conflict adverse other people who are experiencing the conflict and then they're frustrated and it ties into another dimension of generational differences that I learned from you where you talked about some of the younger generations seeing the workplace as family. And so when they, 
when they see their workplace as like an extension or, or actually maybe they that is their family any tension that exists even if it's normal and natural feels like conflict and so sometimes it's confusing because when you're of a different generation and you think you know it's just people i work with other people are defining co conflict completely differently so however you define it a friendly generationally inclusive culture resolves conflict in a constructive way they also give customized positive feedback so this isn't just the hey great job but very specifically personalizes the feedback uh, they involve others in decisions that affect them so uh, to your point Catherine people are expecting you know when this involves me I need to be part of it and that's not always practical but as much as possible um, a friendly culture shows concern for the needs of others it's supportive of others and their uniqueness. And I think that's a really big shift. And, and I talked about that yesterday um, in that leadership team conversation where uh, we were walking through what the leadership team needed from the CEO. And it was interesting because each of the team members were listing out things that mattered to them. And then one of the team members raised his hand and he said, that doesn't all apply to me. So then we added another line that was kind of, if you know each person needed to have a conversation with the ceo and help him understand which elements of that list were important and essential to them so the support the encouragement the feedback isn't a one size fits all anymore it needs to be personalized because each individual is unique and that's how people in the workplace are expecting to be managed and that i don't know from your research catherine of what's come up there that's a really big change right Absolutely. So some other ways that we behave in a friendly culture is being tactful and tolerant and then dealing with people in a friendly and pleasant way. So all descriptions that help you better understand the behaviors that exist in a culture that's friendly. So let's look at that from each of the generations. Okay. So for the boomers, they're wondering am i valued right do you understand the sacrifices i've made to get us all where we are today boomers worked very hard sacrificing a lot in the home so that they could succeed professionally and i hear many boomers talking about you know they're they're doing a lot of mentoring of younger employees and they often feel i i think in some ways hurt and disregarded or not recognized for the hard work and the resilience they've had and the things they've endured along the way to make the workplace a much more safe and friendly environment today than it was when they were in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Yeah, Catherine, isn't it true that this was sort of the generation where you followed the company, right? That's part of the sacrifice. Yep. So you got the corporate job and some people moved from place to place to place. Yep. Where I talk, talk to people today and there's many that can't imagine that, you know, their, their company asked them to relocate and they're like, are you crazy? My friends are here. I'm not moving. Right. Exactly. It's, it, we're making different choices for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. And the tip for working with the boomers is choose acceptance over judgment. One this, I hear this all the time. It cracks me up how much I hear this actually. So boomers love to have a piece of paper in front of them, right? They love something tangible to walk away with. They want to be able to take notes on something and interact with it in kind of that physical sense. And they've got millennial and Gen Z employees going, you just killed a tree by passing out all those handouts. Why didn't you just do it digitally? You know, this, this is one place, like, don't judge them. This is their way. This is the way they've been doing it their whole life. And we need to meet them where they're at and honor that. And if, if they want to go digital, great. If they don't, let them use their paper. But don't, don't pass judgment on them for that. And make sure that you actually pay attention to why they're doing what they're doing. There may be some value in it for the other generations. There's a new movement towards more journaling, right? Millennials are writing more physically rather than using a computer in different spaces. So perhaps there's some value to paying attention to the way the boomers have done a lot of things. And then if you're a boomer, ask yourself, 
how can I express my experience and wisdom in a way that resonates with the desires and values of everyone else? You know, I sat through a presentation where a, a former CEO, he was a boomer, he was talking to a group of millennials. And one of the millennials asked uh, how he said he and his wife were navigating their career choices and trying to do that together. And he asked the boomer if he had any advice. And the boomer said, well, yes, you should always have your wife involved in your career decisions. And he missed the heart of the question that the millennial was asking because the millennial, he and his wife both have full-time careers. They're both pursuing it. I, th I think one may have uh, been asked to move to another city. So he was looking for wisdom around that. And the boomer went back to their values and the way his family had worked when he was moving up in his career and so there was a huge disconnect so boomers make sure you know you're really asking seeking to understand where they're coming from and what are the questions they're asking so that you can uh, the wisdom that you're sharing actually matches uh, their questions for gen x gen xers want to know do you see the value i'm bringing gen xers are very responsible they have a ton of plates spinning in the air right now. They've got children growing up. They've got aging parents. Most of them work full time. So they want to know that their value is being recognized. So the tip for those of us working with Gen Xers is to take time to stop and check in. It's easy to overlook Gen Xers. And this is the most common thing I hear from them is that, you know, why are the millennials getting all the attention? We feel like we're the ones doing a lot of the work. So don't, don't discount the sense of, I guess, uber responsibility that Gen Xers feel. And if they really are holding things together, recognize that with them, affirm their hard work and take time to say thank you. That will go miles with a Gen Xer. And if you're a Gen Xer, make sure you're checking your resentment meter, as well as make sure you're not biting off more than you can chew. So what do you mean by a resentment meter? Just curious. So a lot of Gen Xers, I think, feel resentful. They feel overlooked. They're, you know, they're the middle, middle child generation. Mm -hmm. So I think often they just want some attention right? And they want to be recognized for what they're contributing, but it's easy to overlook them because they are so responsible and they'll keep those plates spinning without a lot of attention because they're very self-led. Mm -hmm. So Gen Xers have to be careful not to be resentful for perhaps the, the perceived attention that other generations are getting and to understand how they're either feeding that or ways they can help safeguard against it. Got it. For millennials, they want to know, is what I have to say valued? I was at, did a presentation recently where a boomer stood up and she said, well, every time I need a technology fix, I just walk out into the middle office and say, I need a millennial. And what, what happens every time she does that is her millennial employees don't feel valued and they feel like the only, the only thing I bring to this place is my expertise in technology. And they don't want to feel like that. So make sure you're recognizing other strengths that, the, that your millennial employees bring and make sure that when, when they are sharing their voice, that there are ways that they're, they, they definitely feel heard. It's not just, okay, I said it, but that it's actually heard and taken into consideration. Your tip for working with millennials is taking time making time to listen to them, to laugh with them, and to learn from them. Building that relationship, whether it's a coaching relationship or it's just spending time with them over a lunch, giving them those avenues and those outlets to have their voice heard. And if you're a millennial, understand that those who've gone before you have gained a lot of wisdom over time. And sometimes they might not be open to hearing what you have to say. They might also have full plates. And as we've been talking about the feedback loop, your older generations aren't as used to giving as much feedback or receiving as much feedback. And so they might just feel frustrated. 
but don't take it personally and be thankful for the times when you are heard. Also, remember that not everything we say matters and people look at different experiences and different situations and different problems through different lenses. So we have to understand the context within which we're sharing our thoughts and realize that other people might have wisdom to share too. And you might not be the first person to have the idea you're sharing, that other people might have wisdom that you don't necessarily have yet because you haven't had the experience and perhaps seeking to ask more questions rather than keep trying to force your idea. That's a, a pretty common problem across older generations right now. For Gen Z, they are wanting to know, do I like the people I work with and do they like me? As Donna mentioned, that second family feeling at work is really, really important. And there was a recent survey done with Gen Zers in the workplace, and 47% of them said having fun in the workplace was the thing that would make them apply for a job. So they want to know that it's a place they're going to enjoy, and they want to enjoy the people they're with. The tip, if you're working with Gen Zers, is to talk to them in person versus emailing them with an issue. They want that face-to-face -face interaction, they're craving it, and email is most likely probably not the best way to reach them. If you're a Gen Zer, remember that relationships take work and they take time. So give yourself and others time to grow together. Also remember that there are different levels of relationship. There's colleagues, and there's friends and that not everyone will like you and you you're not going to like everyone else that's just not the way the world works and donna you were talking the other day about how even the president can be elected without half the country in support so just because you're a leader or you're a person holding a position or a role within an organization doesn't mean that people are going to respect that and like that so next we have our third cultural attribute. So the last uh, element we're gonna talk about here is focused. So a generally inclusive, generationally <laughs> and generally inclusive culture is focused. So we went through fearless, friendly, now we're talking focused and a person's experience who's in a culture that's generationally inclusive and focused, exhibits the focused cultural attribute, feels this way, they know how what they do every single day contributes to the organization and to something bigger than themselves. So some of the ways that people behave in an organization that is focused is they think ahead and plan, they take on challenging tasks, they explore alternatives before acting, they know the business, and this is one of the areas for leaders, you know, how are you helping your organization, members of your organization, really understand what you do? Um, I know there was one um, large Fortune 50 company we worked with where they took all of their employees through a workshop and helped them understand kind of like how they made money. Uh, it was an organization where um, because of how they did business, um, it took them three years before they started realizing profit on their customers and it helped their customer service agents understand the importance of their role. So knowing the business is really important in a focused organization. Uh, people also work for the sense of accomplishment, so feedback matters, positive um, reinforcement's great, but also an internal sense of accomplishment, pursuing a standard of excellence, setting moderately difficult goals, so stretch goals are good, um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't have them, but um, you need to push yourself without being to the extreme and working to achieve those self-set goals. And then finally, empowering others. So those are all examples of behaviors that are present in a generationally inclusive culture that's focused. So let's look at that from each of the generation's viewpoints. Okay, so boomers, they wonder, how is what we are doing helping us achieve our goals. Remember, boomers were set out to achieve the American dream. So they want to know, how is this helping me reach that? 
But then there's also a shift with the boomers where a lot of boomers at this stage in life, they're starting to think more about how they can give back and what that would look like. So keep that in mind when you're talking about purpose with your boomer employees. Uh, the tip is to appreciate their contribution and the legacy that they are leaving. And then if you're a boomer, are you open to achieving the same goals, but in different ways? You are often probably used to getting to the office very early and then staying late if you have to, right? Boomers were competing to get to the top, but other generations are kind of less caught up on quote unquote doing their time. And they're looking more at the goals they are trying to achieve and different ways to achieve the same or similar outcomes. So really ask yourself in your workplace, are you managing by observation or by objectives? One of the big complaints I hear from millennials, and this obviously isn't in every workplace, but this does still happen, is that they're not allowed to get up from their desk. Right? Because the only time they're seen as doing their work is when they're in their seat, rather than allowing people to be creative, move around, you know, interact, collaborate. It depends on how your culture is set up. But that's, a, that's an important thing to think about as a boomer and the expectations you have around that. For Gen X, are the steps to get us to the end goal efficient and productive? Remember, Gen X, they have a lot of plates spinning in the air. And one of the Gen X mottos is work hard, play hard, right? So if I'm at work, I want to be focused. I want to get it done. I want to make it happen so that when I'm done, I can go play. The tip is explain why what I am doing matters. They, Gen Xers, want to do things that make sense. They're very systems oriented. So if it's not relevant, they want to be equipped to go do something else. And they have uh, what's called portable careers, right? No matter what I'm doing, I want to be able to take those skills and take it, take it um, to some place where it matters. So if they don't know why what they're doing matters, they will probably be pretty disengaged. And as a Gen Xer, does your team understand what your idea of efficient and productive means? Don't be afraid to delegate. You might believe you're the best one to do everything all the time, but look for opportunities to get others involved. It might not feel efficient in the moment, but it will certainly help with your productivity and employee engagement in the long run. For millennials, they wanna know how they're contributing to the greater good. The tip is tell them how what they are doing directly makes a difference. They want to have purpose now. They want to create world change now. They saw their boomer parents sacrifice so much to get to the end of their careers or at this point in their careers, and they don't want to be on that same path. They want to have purpose now. And if you're a millennial, remember, sometimes we have to do things that we don't like to do to impact the greater good or the greater goal. And we don't always get to work in our strengths. Accomplishing our goals takes time. And we tend to overestimate what we can get done in one year, but we underestimate what we can get done in five years. So stick with the goals and with the team so that everyone grows. For Gen Z, this one seems to shock a lot of boomers and sometimes even Gen Xers. But they want to know, not just are we helping the greater good, but how are we saving the planet and or impacting people? Remember, they grew up hearing reduce, reuse, recycle over and over and over again. They're watching the Great Barrier Reef disappear. There's a ban on plastic straws that's sweeping the nation. Social media creates a growing awareness that wasn't there 30, 40 years ago. So they know what's going on they, and they want the planet to be a healthy and safe space for them and their children. The tip with your Gen Zers is offer them ways to help tell the story of the good they are doing. 
give them opportunities. They will take full ownership of it. And if, if they, if they believe their job and the company they work for is doing amazing things to help people on the planet, they will tell their friends, they will recruit their friends. They will have it all over social media because they want to share about who they are and how they're impacting the world on their, their social media feeds. And then if you're a Gen Zer, um, remember that saving the planet and impacting people are complex things and have many variables. And before you get frustrated because something isn't done exactly the way you think it should be or the way you want it to be, seek to understand the bigger picture and don't hesitate to listen and learn from those who've gone before you. Because I guarantee you there's a reason why they're doing what they're doing. So this is just a quick summary. And from this conversation today, we'll send you a handout that will hopefully help you think through these questions and help you, you know, think about as you're looking at this, what is one takeaway that you want to implement this week at the office as you interact with other generations? Thanks, Catherine. So as we wrap up this conversation, just a quick um, review of some of the benefits. So when you have a generationally inclusive culture that's fearless, friendly, and focused, here are three significant things that will occur. First of all, you get more innovation. Makes me crazy because so many companies are investing, you know, thousands, millions of dollars in classes and innovation centers when the reality is if your culture is not supporting innovation, it's not really going to help you to just spend a lot of money on training in a new building. So you'll get better in, or increased levels of innovation when your culture is fearless, friendly, and focused. In addition, we already talked about the fact you'll attract and retain the right people. Not every worker is right for your organization. So as you are fearless, friendly, and focused and very um, specific about what makes you unique, you'll get the right people and they'll stay working at your organization and finally, as more and more Gen Zers enter the workplace, um, by having a generationally inclusive culture, you'll avoid the potential catastrophe that's coming as we're having more and more millennials managing Gen Z, Gen X, boomers, and so on, with a lack of understanding between the generations. So... Fearless, friendly, and focused is the way to go, and it's what is incredibly important in today's world. So um, we have time maybe for one quick question, and then we're going to move to a final wrap-up. So, um, Catherine, one of the things that I often hear is, All right, I'm not the boss, so I can't make a difference in the culture. What's a quick tip or something to think about um, that people can do if they're not the boss? Great question. I would say, you know, in my prior experience, you know, I'm a Gen Xer and I, our leadership uh, where I used to work was very traditionalist, boomers in the administrative level. And then I had to translate to a lot of millennials and then Gen Zs there at the end were coming up. So learning and thinking about how do I, who is the generation I'm talking to and how do I translate? Because it might be as simple as I need to use an emoji right now, or I need to wear a suit today because I have to look very professional and convey the right message so that I can command respect in the room. And so understanding, being adaptable to the context that you're in and helping the generations around you be able to communicate with one another, being a bridge builder rather than someone who is um, passing judgment or using bias when you're communicating. Excellent, great insight. So as we wrap up this conversation, um, thanks Wade for sharing your insight that how and where you give feedback and develop people as well as cultivating relationships can vary between generations. So fantastic insight and hopefully you've got some takeaways. Uh, we will, as Catherine said, be sharing with you that worksheet that summarizes the questions that each generation has in the context of those cultural attributes, as well as the tips for relating to them.
And so for everybody who is participating, you will receive a follow-up email. We're going to share the slides with you, the um, overview worksheet that Catherine talked about, as well as a recording of the webinar and all the resources that we have that can um, benefit you in your pursuit to create a generationally inclusive culture in your workplace, in your team, in your volunteer organization, even within your family. And, um, and we're really excited to be able to be working with organizations to help them develop this kind of culture. So if you're interested in learning more, feel free to reach out, with, out to us. And with that, um, Catherine, if there's any last words of wisdom you'd like to share with anybody, we'll um, have you do that and then wrap up. Yeah, I would say be a, be a bridge builder and that this, um, this is an incredibly relevant topic that's not going away. I think it's only going to become a stronger need, you know, as, as, the, as Gen Z enters and technology continues to evolve. So don't back away from it, but move toward it. And I think great things can happen as we all learn to work together. Fabulous. Great advice. And for all of you who are learning more and more, um, we hope that you're ambassadors of the message in helping people understand the value of being that build, bridge builder. So have a spectacular rest of your day, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to connecting with you on an upcoming webinar.